Oh, the church in the valley. Oh, that little white church is the place I love so well. Now I'm sad and lonely. Yes, I'm sad and lonely for that little white church in the dell. There's a little white church in the valley that stands in my memory each day. And it seems I can hear the bells ring, though I am many miles away, and many times on Sunday morning, that whole countryside would gather there. Church is the place I love so well. Oh, I'm sad and lonely. Yes, I'm sad and lonely for that little white church in the day. They would sing the old song, Rock of Ages. Oh, Christ, I said, I hide myself in thee. And I know some of them are now waiting. Just for oh, the dark and stormy sea, I know their troubles are all ended, and happy forever they will be. They are waiting and watching up yonder for the coming home of you and me. Oh, that church in the valley, oh, that little white church is the place. I love so well. Now I'm sad and lonely. Yes, I'm sad and lonely. For that little white church in the everybody. Can you hear me better now? No. no. Okay. One more time, Jay. How about now? Yay! Welcome to New Kirk in the Wild. Um, we're, we're glad you're here. We're glad it's a little breezy and cooler than last week. Church in the Wild. There you go. I actually have a friend whose church is named that, Billy, in Florida. Um, but we're, we're glad you're here. We hope that you will feel God's presence in community and through God's word and scripture and prayer and music. Uh, we would invite you to, uh, we're glad that you're all appropriately distanced and masked. Uh, we've got one announcement this morning. I'd like to have Christy go ahead and give that to us before uh, our call to worship. Good morning. This is so bizarre, I have to keep saying. Um, so great to see all of you. I wanted to give you an update. We've um, had a request to do a missions uh, trip to Walterboro, and I apologize for not knowing details other than 
they um, they need some help removing some debris. And so there was uh, Keith did a great article in the newsletter, and I sent out a limited email to some folks, and I've got some responses. But wanted you to know that on the 22nd, which is a Monday. A team from Newkirk, so far we have seven confirmed, are going to go and bring chainsaws and gloves and masks and socially distance while we're helping that community. Um, details are going to come out this week on just coordination and where what the actual houses are that we're going to be helping with. But the idea is that we will take debris from individual houses and then pull it out to the streets so it can get picked up. So it's a one-day trip, um, just on Monday the 22nd. If you're interested at all, please um, get back with me, and we'll get you signed up. Thanks very much. What's that? Oh, yes. We'll be working with FEMA, and that's part of the coordination, is um, they're going to um, work with the city and, and just get back with us, like I said, on which houses and, and what area we're going to be hitting. So... Thanks. If you have it in front of you, let us read responsibly our call to worship. I love the Lord because He has heard my voice and my supplications, because He has inclined His ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon Him as long as I live. Good morning. It's so nice to see all of you out there this morning. Let's lift our voices in song together to worship our Lord. into the sunshine for a moment. I've missed um, doing morning prayer with you all, and it's kind of hard to see expressions <laughs> right now. I'm sure that's a little intimidating, Mikey, but um, I'm just so happy to be back together with you guys and, and get to worship God together. So let's go to God in prayer this morning. Almighty Father, it truly is a blessing, an amazing blessing that I realize now I myself took for granted to be able to come together and openly fellowship and worship you. And Lord, it matters not that we're sitting in the beauty of your creation this morning versus a building 
versus a car, it doesn't matter. What matters is that where two or three of us gather together, you are here in our midst. And Lord, we're thankful, we're grateful, we're humbled. These are difficult times for our globe, Lord. The things that used to happen just locally have spilled over through social media, through main news sources, and sometimes it's just very difficult to decipher where and what the truth is. So Lord, what I ask this morning is that you fill our hearts with your truth. You speak your words to us. And those words, and those words alone, that we can find in your scriptures, that we can find in the gospel, the good news, those words will guide us. They will be our compass of what to do next, and then next, and then next. Because when we find that truth inside of ourselves that is given to us from you, then we know that we can take out your love to this world, to this broken, lost, lonely, sad world that is ever so desperate for your love and your guidance and your direction. Lord, may we be those vessels, those vessels of truth that you pour into us. Let us each go to the word. Let us study it. There's time now. We're stiller than we have been in a long time. We can take that time, study your word, learn about you, form an even better relationship with you so that we can be your emissaries. Lord, let us be still this morning. Let us appreciate the beauty in the air, the flow of the wind, the beauty in the sunshine, the blossoming of the trees and flowers, the birds as they sing to us, and our fellow humans that sit near us, although not beside us. Let us be grateful. Let us listen to the words that Pastor Larry and Pastor Mike would bring to us this morning. Let it move us to be better people, better followers. All these things we ask in your son's name. Amen. number three. We're going to make it. Um, so today I'm going to read to you from Romans. I don't know if you've read Romans lately. Uh, when you read Romans, um, you think, wow, Paul really seems like he's saying something awesome. But I'm not following. Uh, it's almost like reading, uh, if you've ever had to read German writers, they would... Uh, they just do this all the time. They circle and circle and circle. And if you miss the circle up here, uh, just forget it. You got to start over. Um, so Paul's kind of like that too. So we're gonna I'm gonna read you a little section from Paul, which means I'm gonna read one of those little circles of about a million. Um, but then I'm gonna try to um, talk to you a little bit in the sermon about maybe what could possibly be going on here. But I think we'll find it's good news. So let us pray before we start. Father, thank you that we are here. We ask now that you would just clean our minds and our hearts. Thank you for Carl for holding the tent that just became a kite. And Lord, we uh, ask that as we hear your word, that um, you would open us up and show us the way. All this in Christ's name. Amen. And amen. All right. Pentecost was a few weeks ago, but we still have the wind. 
Paul says in Romans 5, therefore, now when you hear therefore, you know you just miss some stuff, right? So we're going to start with the therefore that you have no idea what he's talking about. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have also obtained access through him by faith into his grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance and endurance produces proven character and proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, while we were still sinners, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, Though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So uh, when reading a book like Romans, it helps to have some familiarity with basic concepts of ancient Greek philosophy. No, I'm not going to give you too much of that today, but I just want to give you the hint that if we want to understand Paul's, here's a big word, dialectic, then we're going to have to have some basic understanding of what did Paul think the world was made of and how did Paul's cosmos line up. So we'll get into a little bit of that. But Paul would have lived, moved, and had his being in a reality constructed by this Greek thinking. And you might say, well, Paul was a Jew. Well, sort of a Jew, right? But there's questions. Um, some people have even ventured as far to say Paul might have been actually born into the family of the Herods. If you look at uh, Josephus, Josephus will talk about this one Solace who was... Uh, part of the Herodian family, Paul, in even one of his letters, alludes to, hey, greet my relative Herodias. So if Paul is at all connected with a family like that, which is, don't be fooled, they're not Jews, right? They are Romans, pretty much, um, or Idumeans. Paul would have been educated, and if Paul would have been educated, he would have been educated with the knowledge of the day. What was the knowledge of the day? Knowledge of the day... Alexander the Great had conquered the area. The Romans took the torch and kept on moving. So for like six centuries, Greek thinking would have controlled the area. So Paul is a Greek thinker, whether we like it or not. And so are you, actually, but that's a whole different story. So this lens, if you'll look at Romans through that particular lens, uh, it won't make a whole lot more sense, but it might shine some new light. So we'll try that. So I'm going to do the impossible today, give you an insufficient little piece of this. And then from there, I want to show you where Paul thought that things had gone awry in the way the cosmos were lined up. He thought something, we had something really wrong. And then we'll kind of look at that and see, well, then what's Paul's fix for it? And what does that mean for you and me? And yes, this will be less than an hour. So again, remember, Paul isn't working with the Hubble telescope. Paul isn't working with the weird physics that's coming out of CERN or the LHC or even the amazingly accurate imagination of Einstein or the cold mechanical world of Newton or even a Copernicus or Galileo who, in spite of the church, said, nope, this is a heliocentric solar system. You see what I mean? Paul doesn't even have any of that going on. But Paul, like the educated of his day, thought Greek thoughts. 
The way to God in Greek thinking was through thought. You think your way to God. Because such thinking assumes that there's some sort of like a, a metaphysical relationship between the mind and the soul. When you are engaged in critical thinking, you are actually, it's a religious experience. Your soul is doing what it was meant to do. And this thinking assumes that the soul's progress comes solely through a desire for godliness, right? The soul is yearning to get back to that pre-existent uh, uh, perfection from which it came. And um, it assumes that the soul, while in the body, is inhibited from that full potential of that pre-existent glory. And it has to recall that glory through a process of, big word again, dialectic, which just means honing your thinking. Uh, you think about Socrates here. It's questions and answers, and you keep asking questions, and you keep asking questions until eventually you keep honing and honing that idea, and you'll eventually arrive at perfection. Paul, with the Greeks, probably believed in an ordered cosmos, but he would have ordered the cosmos the way the Greeks did. And it's a very kind of, well, not simple at all, but I'm going to try to make it simple. Imagine a totem pole where you've got God and the greatest good sitting on top of that totem pole. Now let's go all the way to the bottom. At the bottom of that pole, you've got us, and we're living in this world of uh, particulars. Life is our participation in the particulars. And the particulars are always decaying and they're imperfect, which is why they don't last. And then you've got this weird thing in the middle called forms. What are forms? Forms are like if God was an architect and God had written out this blueprint. And so this blueprint is what each particular is supposed to be in the world. So life is about, like for the soul, there is a particular form of the perfect soul. So life becomes this journey of the soul trying to uh, either match that form or fall short of that form, and we know what usually happens. So perfect alignment of the cosmos happens when you've got the good, the form, and the particular all synced up, right? So that's what Paul, I believe, is trying to do in Romans. He's trying to sync up the good God with the form. We'll talk about what that is in a minute. And then with us. So Paul thought that everything, everything had gone awry in the alignment. The problem is not that the world is busted up, but that we've got the world busted up in the way that we are perceiving it. So Paul confronts those who thought that Doing works of the law was the way to righteousness, right? If you read Romans, that's what he's arguing against. Why should a person try to be righteous to begin with? The Greeks thought that the soul's ultimate purpose is to be godly. Now, again, when were the Greeks thinking this? They were thinking it like in the 6th and 5th century B.C., right? So this is before we get most of our, even our good biblical literature. So the Greeks thought that the soul's ultimate purpose is to be godly. And when Paul says in Corinthians that of faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love, he's saying that what the philosophers had said for centuries. He's just repeating what they've said. Good reveals itself in truth, beauty, and love. And the soul imitates the good when it loves. There you have it. So love is the highest good of the soul. First John 4 says it blatantly. God is love. Not God is like love. Not God loves you, but God is love. So love in Greek philosophy, not in the Bible, it's different, but in Greek philosophy, love is eros, right? Eros is passion and desire and 
and yearning, right? It's what gets the, the soul going. So the soul's desire and yearning, its arrows, its love, is for the greatest good. And for Paul, the law has been corrupted by sin in our fixation on works. Remember, the good, the form, and the particular must align. So when God is the good, and the law is the form, and works are the particular, then Paul says sin will increase. If you make the law the form and works the particular thing that we need to do to get to God, Paul says that alignment is wrong. There's a kink in your plow line. So Paul says that sin will increase then. This alignment is wrong because it denigrates the soul instead of purifying the soul into the image of God, which is the soul's purpose. And if the soul is not becoming more and more shaped into the image of God, then you've got something wrong with your math. The soul is no longer desiring to emulate the good when the soul is fixated on works and the soul is looking to the law. So using both Genesis 15.6 and Psalm 31 in particular, Paul is going to create a whole new alignment for us. The good, the forms, and the particulars. Abraham becomes the archetype of a particular. So Abraham is going to be on the bottom of this totem pole for a minute. So he becomes the archetype of a particular that gets made righteous through faith alone. Now faith becomes the form, not the law. And then in the same way, Paul's going to talk about Christ. Put Christ on the bottom of that, his earthly existence. I know we're the church. But put Christ on the bottom of the totem pole for a minute. Christ will become righteous through faith. The medium there, the form, putting to death the works-bound corpse of the law. So the resurrection is God's ultimate gesture of approval for this alignment for Paul. How does Paul know he got an A on the test? The resurrection. Proof that the new alignment is the correct one. So just as Abraham was the first fruits of the faithful, Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection for all. Again, this happens almost universally in this cosmos when this alignment happens. Through faith, not the law, the soul fulfills its one true end. Through faith, not the law, not works of the law, through faith, the soul finds its one true end. And in Paul's dialectic, the way Paul's, if you read Romans, he's asking his own questions and answering them. It's a conversation with himself, I'm afraid. Um, he discovers a new form that's in play now, and it's faith. So he pulls out the law, and he replaces it with faith. God, faith, and then us, the soul. So Paul's new alignment establishes faith as that form, the perfect blueprint of the righteous soul. You're sitting here today cooking in a parking lot because you have a question. Mike, how do I become righteous? I want to be God-like. I want to fulfill my purpose. I know there's books out there. Uh, one smiling preacher will name his book, Your Best Life Now. Okay? You can figure that one out. Another minister will say, A Purpose Driven Life. Okay? Well, Paul is telling you, you want to be righteous? I'm showing you how it's set up in this world in reality. And faith is the form, the perfect blueprint of the righteous soul. Paul parallels this God-faith-Christ alignment with that God-faith-Abraham alignment. Both righteous Abraham, righteous before the law. Christ, righteous 
putting the law to death. Paul talks about God's grace, God's gift, God's righteousness. These are all words he uses, and they're all synonyms for that greatest good that he would have learned about in his Greek philosophy. In this philosophy, the soul came from the perfect love and spends a lifetime embodied trying to recall that love. Trying to recall that love. God's ideal for a human soul is to be an image of God like we read about in Genesis. In his own image, he created them, right? One, according to Paul, that is not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of the mind into what? Doggone it, he tells us, the good. Those archetypes of Abraham and Christ, they demonstrate what Martin Luther and Calvin shouted at us, faith alone as God's vision for the human soul. Faith alone. Paul's gospel then is a corrective to those who believe that you get to heaven or that you get on God's good side by doing righteous deeds. It's a corrective to those who fall under a cultural law. It's a corrective to those who think you can behave your way into God's good graces. And it's an incentive to those who've never heard that there was a law to begin with. Why? Because faith is the form. Faith is like a natural law and not particular works of some particular law. So what does faith look like? This is the part that really matters to you because you're like, all right, Mike, you lost me a minute ago. Good. Catch up because this is easy. You got to do two things. Mike, I want one of these souls that are yearning for for the good, who's yearning for God. I want to be godly. Mike, can you tell me today? I can. My book would have two statements in it if I took it from Paul. It's a two-step process. And the formula is in verse 2 of our passage today. It reads, By Christ also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. The formula is simple. Step one, just as Abraham's faith in God imagined all hindrances removed from God's promise, namely the dead seed in Abraham and the non-existent eggs in Sarah, just as Christ's faith in God imagined all hindrances removed from the promise, namely death itself, Jesus could say, I'm going to die, but look, in three days, I'm coming back. The soul is faithful when imagining God's will already achieved, despite what it looks like on the outside world. That's step one. Step two, just as Abraham gave glory to God for the promised son, despite the hopeless appearances, the soul is faithful when it rejoices in advance. Now, again, I'm not talking about a fake party. I'm talking about the soul that knows and can rejoice on the front end of the promise. God says it's going to happen, and I believe it and trust it so much that I'm going to go ahead and rejoice that it is so. That is Paul's gospel, Paul's realignment. You can call it atonement because that's just a word that means, here we go, at one meant. What's at one meant? Things are lined up. Christ becomes the narrow gate to a dialectic that leads the soul to faith. Christ said narrow is the, is the gate, right, that leads to God, but wide is the gate. Well, the law is that wide gate that's corrupting the soul through failed attempts, failed 
words. If I think I can go out there and I can get it, I can work hard enough for it, failed words. That's a big gate. But the narrow gate is this trust in Christ. Our participation in faith in this life, in a world of particulars then, is twofold. Number one, trust God by imagining God's will has come to pass. Imagine a world where what you know is right, what you believe and yearn for from the Lord is already here. You imagine that world. And then step two, you rejoice that in God's will, it has been done. I may not be able to see it. I may not be able to see it. But it has come to pass. Now you understand the faith and how your own soul is reconciled to God when imagining God has indeed, as Paul says, commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's Paul's faith. That's the faith in the righteousness of Christ, and it's Paul's faith in Christ which makes him righteous, you see. That even while we were at our worst, not when you finally got your mess together, but when you were hopeless, that's when God went ahead and fixed everything for you, and your righteousness is simply to believe that it is so and to rejoice that it is so. Therefore, church, that's why we lift our souls, even in this world turned upside down. That's why we lift our souls together in thanksgiving. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let us affirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed as our guide. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We come now to our time of prayer, and we, uh, I believe Stephanie has walked around with the prayers of the congregation, uh, and she will be joining us later for that, or coming up now. But let us come and bring our prayers to God. Oh God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the good news of Paul into a world that is upside down in many ways that Paul was referring to. We have so many things on our heart. First of all, since we are so filled, let us take a moment of silence to pray for all of those things that sometimes we can't even bring to words. Let us pray. God, you have heard our hearts. Answer those prayers we, play, we pray. We pray for our world that is engulfed in so much right now, that is worried about sickness and health and illness and disease and pandemic. Help us to be a part of the answer and the solution on that. Help us to care for our neighbor in the midst of that. We also are reminded that even though this is what is on the, the headlines, 
that there are other things in the world far away in Syria, in Sudan, in Haiti, in the Middle East. We also pray for our doctors, our nurses, for all of those who are having to make hard decisions about what it is to open schools or go back to work, how to do that safely and sanely. We pray for those that are uh, giving advice on that and having to make decisions on that. Make them wise and caring, we pray. We pray also, O oh God, for our, our country that is engulfed in conversation about what racism is, about what it means to live in community with one another, to look at one another and see brother and sister and not to see enemy. Help us to be bringers of your peace to the world. You proclaim that blessed are the peacemakers, God. Help us to work to bring peace and justice to all we see as our society talks about things that have been under the surface for long, long times. Give us grace and love. Give us mercy and justice. We pray for our Governor Henry, our President Donald, and for our Mayor. We pray for all churches. Help us to be instruments of healing. Help us to be instruments of community and of hope to a world that is broken and lonely at this time. And we pray now the prayers of our very people. We have a lot of prayers this morning, Father. We pray for neck pain recovery for Terry. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. For healing for Madeline. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. Sleep, beautiful sleep for Allison and peace of mind. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. Our beautiful Ann Gillespie is back at Lexington Medical Center. We pray for her and for Tony. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Continue prayers for Neva and Tyler. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For Dan Griffin family, loss of his mother. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For Avery and Alex Horton and their healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For Gail Jenkins in her radiation treatments. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For H.H. and Nancy's son, Stephen, for healing and a diagnosis. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Simply for broken relationships. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We continue to pray for Anastasia's mom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Our hearts remain heavy and we pray for Harry and Carter and the loss of their daughter. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For Gwen's grandson for guidance. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Prayers for our beautiful Linda for rest. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For police officers and military for the job that they do to keep us safe at home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for Sandra and Alyssa Hensley for a job interview and for Sandra to find her way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And for a friend of Chris, Lisa Harwell, for neck surgery. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we pray in thanksgiving for an, a super anniversary for Mike and Melissa this month. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we go into the world, uh, two things. I just saw a lizard eat a bug, and that was the coolest thing I think I've ever seen. <laughs> you won't get that unless you're an outdoor worship. Uh, second thing is, look, as you go into the world, look, go in faith. That's what Paul's trying to tell us. What kind of faith? Where do I direct my faith? We direct our faith in a God who loves every single soul that has, that is here, and that will ever come to this planet. Every soul so much that even when that soul was broken and misguided and chasing all the wrong rabbits down all the wrong holes, that God loved that soul so much that when that soul could do nothing for itself, could do nothing to get itself out of its trouble, could not do any works of any law, God sent his own son Christ, who was righteous for each and every one of those souls, who did the right thing by God for each and every one of those souls. Folks, there's no better gospel than that. I'm not telling you that you have to get your beliefs right and that you have to come down up here front and, and pray the prayers. I'm telling you of a God who loves you so much that even in a busted up broken world that we're in right now, God loves each and every soul. The police officer, the victim, even when the police officer is the victim, the military man, the government official, Yes, I swallowed mouth vomit, right? And I said swallow. So, look, I'm telling you, the Lord loves you. And that's what Paul was trying to show us with his big old brain through this book. That it's through faith. You believe in that God. Not because that belief gets you anywhere, but because just live in a world where you imagine it's so. And then start your rejoicing today. That it is true. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he be kind and gracious to you and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. See